Hey, this is JC, and I'm back with another game dev inspired Redshift tutorial. Years ago, I was browsing SimonStripe.de, but I found this cool visual breakdown of how Fallout 3 does its edgeware using decals, and I figured that was pretty cool, but at the time, I didn't think much of it. I just filed it away as a cool technique, maybe one day in the future. More recently, I found this tutorial from Leonardo Lezzi, which goes in much more into detail, and after my last tutorial, I figured I could adapt this for Cinema 4D. Leonardo says it best, I'm not reinventing the wheel, or even trying to act like it's mine. I'm just showing you how the wheel works. And I want to reemphasize that fact. I didn't come up with this technique, but I'm just showing you how to implement it inside of Cinema 4D. Now I couldn't find any edgeware normal maps online, so I had to make my own. Uh, in this tutorial, the first part's gonna be sculpting our own edgeware. The second's gonna be baking it down into a normal map, and then maybe cleaning up those normal maps a little bit in Photoshop. Then we're gonna make the decal geometry itself. And finally, we're gonna put these normals on a map and implement the material inside of Redshift. So what are edgeware decals? In video games, decals are any kind of texture that you can just stamp onto a piece of geometry and it sticks there. Edgeware decals are normal maps applied to the edges of geometry to give the illusion of wear and tear without a ton of additional overhead. Put simply, for any edge you have, you put a little patch over the outside with normal decals on it and that decal implies a lot more geometry resolution than you have. We're gonna take this cube and sculpt in our own edges into each of these four corners. Uh, but first we need to do a little bit of setup to make sure that everything transfers over properly. Um, I'm gonna first add some segments to this cube, C to convert to geometry. And now we're gonna do something a lot of people in cinema fear. We're gonna UV unwrap it. Our cube UVs are laid out for each face to be the, a face in UVs, but that's not what we want. We want each corner to be a face in UVs. So we need to shift some things around. First, we need to get rid of the top and bottom faces because we're not gonna use them at all. I'm just gonna scale them down to zero. Be sure to set your scale back to one. Then we're gonna take, let's see, this is XZ. So we'll take this as our first corner. This is the left side of our edge, but the right side of our UVs and similar on the other side. So we need to swap them. We're gonna move each by 0.5. And then we're gonna move them all over one. So this will be our first tile. Now I'm gonna do it for each of the four corners. I'm gonna move this one to the left, move this one to the right, move them all over two. We're gonna build a whole tile set going all the way around down the line. Now that we've gotten them all, we need to smush them down into the actual UV coordinates. To do that, I'm gonna do a loop selection with UL, and then I'm gonna scale this down by 0.25, so they should all squish down into one UV tile. Make sure to turn off move. Now I'm going to move them all into the tile system. It's probably three, negative three. Let's find out, too much. Uh, add 0.5, cool. Now we've got our UVs properly set up. Don't know why brush just came up. But now we've got our UVs properly set up and we can go back and get ready to sculpt. Let's call this cube, cube, layout, duplicate and hide the other one in case we need to go back to it. And we'll call this cube sculpt. Now, if you've done any modeling before, you know that this is not enough geometry to properly sculpt. So we're gonna add in some edge loops to give us that extra geo. Get the knife tool, which is K, and then I'm gonna use plane tool, which is J. So KJ, add a whole bunch of edge loops to this model. We're also gonna need some geometry going up. KJ again for the plane cut. And this time I'm gonna add more than one cut. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use these parameters over here. Let's add 10 cuts. And we don't want them all going up, we want some down too. So let's offset it by a bunch and space each one of these out. This should be enough geometry for us to do our sculpt. Make a quick copy label this preform and we're ready to rumble. Let's change the layout to sculpt tools. Um, first, we're gonna make sure our mesh is selected and we're gonna hit subdivide a bunch. Check to make sure your polygon count is not absurd. I think I can go one more subdivision level. We're not gonna need line view anymore. Um, first, I'm gonna take the flatten tool and that's a little bit too big and too much pressure. This edge, that's still too much pressure. And just kind of flatten out this edge a little bit. Uh, I found that the flatten tool kind of just mimics the normal kind of wear and tear an edge would take in a way that looks a little bit more realistic than just a bevel. That's good enough for now. Uh, let's go on to our next edge. Here I'm going to do a quick flatten again. If you go over to the content browser, under your preset window, you'll have some sculpt brush presets. And I recommend looking in here and using these brushes. They have some cool stuff in here. So let's take a look at rocks. And when you double click it, it opens up in the stencil menu. This will let you sculpt in whatever kind of rocks you want into your mesh. Let's set this gray value to one, so all values push into the mesh. 
And my brush is way too big, so let's go back to the settings, make it pretty small, uh, and take down the pressure. So I'm just gonna sculpt in some edge detail here, move a little bit so that the stencil's not in the same place, lower the pressure, do some edges, make this hard flat edge not so noticeable. Uh, let's choose a different rock just for variety, lower the pressure again, and that looks like another cool edge. Let's see what else is in the content browser. Grab some craters, uh, go back to stencil and lower the scale a bunch because we want to see them in our mesh. Set our gray value back to one. Let's add some cool pop marks into this corner. Scale it up a little bit. That's enough pop marks. Let's add some more rock just to fill it in. And let's just add a little bit more detail. You can go pretty hard with this technique, but I'm just gonna add some subtle detail in here. Finally, I'm gonna use this rock texture just for a little bit of variety, but the main thing we're gonna be doing is adding scratches. So let's take down this by a lot and just start roughing up the surface. Let's add some more dents and things into this thing. It's been beat up. It's gotten hit a couple times by some carts or something. That'll be our final edge map. Let's go back to our startup layout. We don't need to sculpt anymore, so I'm going to go to the sculpt tag and just freeze that geometry and then we can have a pretty nice viewport and be all happy. We're going to use our cube preform to be the cage around which our normal map will be created. To do that, we're going to use the object bake material, but we don't have that unless we have a material on our object. Start this again, bake material and name this edge where Let's go PNG for a little bit of compression, but 16 bits so that we're not actually losing any of that data. You can go 4K if you want. I'm just gonna do this for now. We wanna bake our normal maps, and under our normals, we wanna take the normals from Cube Sculpt in tangent space and apply them to Cube Preform. Do not mess with optimal mapping. That changes your UVs to be what it thinks are correct, which is probably gonna be cubic, because it's a cube. We wanna keep our own UV maps. To make sure we do, if we hit preview, we should see vertical lines representing the UVs we set up earlier. Um, and now I'm just gonna bake. If I go to where I saved it, you can see that we now have a custom edgeware atlas that we can use to put these normal maps on any model we want. This texture isn't perfect. You can see at the top and bottom, it's got some issues, uh, but we'll clean that up in Photoshop and then move on from there. So now I'm in Photoshop with our texture and the main thing we needed to clean up are these top and bottom edges, which came from the rounding that occurred when we subdivided the cube. I forgot to add top and bottom edge loops, my bad. But your map might not look this good. Your map might look like this, or this. Both of these issues come about because you don't have enough geometry to make the flat faces be flat. The same way your mesh gets stretched if you put it in a subdivide surface, your normals will get stretched if you don't have enough geometry there to support it. If your map looks like this one, you should go and rebake your map because it's gonna be hard to fix. But if your map looks like this, you can make a new layer in Photoshop with RGB, 128, 128, 255, and pan out the gradients until it looks more like this. Now the way I'm gonna get rid of this is using the spot healing brush, but first we need to isolate the top and bottom. To do that, we're gonna use the offset effect to move these lines into the middle of the screen. And use the spot healing brush tool to get rid of that whole area. If you're lucky, that's the only step you're gonna take. I'm not super lucky, because I need to go in and clean up some of these a little bit. I'm just gonna do that quickly, and then we'll be back with our regularly scheduled tutorial. At some point, if you can't get it to figure it out automatically, you might just have to clone stamp it yourself. Perfect. Now that we have halfway decent edge normals, we need to make a mat for them. Luckily, we know that the neutral value in normal maps is half red, half green, full blue, so we can use that to our advantage. Let's make a folder, and we'll name this mat. We're going to remap these values using curves. First, in RGB, we're going to add a point right at 128 and 0. That's going to be our new black. Then, we're going to add, take the lower value and move it up to the top. Now, we'll bring back some of our detail by adding intermediate points along here. What we're making is an absolute value height map based on the normal map. Let's get rid of this blue. Go into our blues. Just turn that all the way to black. Add another one to do it overall. And this is our basic mat. There's a lot of holes in it, but that's where Photoshop comes in. We're gonna paint it manually, and this is gonna take some time. I'll fast forward through this part so you can get to the end quickly. You can be as detailed as you want or you don't want to here. I'm gonna be roughing it a little bit because this is a tutorial, but 
you take as much time as you think you want for your own edge maps. Crunching the levels uh, overall to try and get a little bit more of a mat on your first try is one thing you can do. Now that I've got a normal mat uh, that works and an alpha mat that covers it, uh, I'm going to export these as PNGs and bring them back into Cinema. Back inside of Cinema, now we need to make the actual trim mesh that we're going to place as a patch over our geometry. Um, to start doing that, we're going to make a cube, make it, I don't know, 20 by 20 or 10. We can do 10. And we're going to convert that into geometry by hitting C and removing some faces. We don't need this face, that face, that face, or the bottom face. We're literally just making a right angle trim. Let's get a material ready to put on it. For now, I'm going to open up our normal map in the color channel uh, just so we can see what's going on in the viewport. I'm also going to do the alpha. And the first thing you'll see is that our texture is not lined up, partially because the tiling is off. So let's expand this. Uh, even if we offset it, we have the next edge in the chain, not the edge that we want. You know what that means? More UV unwrapping. Uh, luckily, this one is not going to be too bad. Uh, let's get our UVs, select one face. This is the face we want to be on the left. This is the face we want to be on the right. Let's move it over by one. Select both faces, scale them down by 0.5 and not move them. And now we actually do want to move it by 0.5 back. Now this face is on the left, this face is on the right. Our edge is in the center. And if we go back to our starter playout, you can see that the normal is actually on the edge. And we can choose our normal. 100 is this one, 200 is this one, 300 is this one, zero and 400 are this one. Open the commander with shift C and look for axis center. Here it is. And we want our model axis to be at X 100, Z minus 100, because this is the corner here, X, Z. Recenter the cube. This is our trim mesh. Let's copy this over into the scene I've already prepared and get going. And paste. This is a scene with just our trim and a cube in it and a concrete texture from the Grayscale Gorilla Everyday Material Collection. We're going to use this as a base to add our edge decals. Let's start by adding our trim to our cube. We're going to use a cloner and drop our trim right inside. We don't want it to be linear. We want to clone it onto our cube and we don't want it to be on the surface. We want it to be on edges. That's not the right way around. So let's go into the transform settings, loop it all the way around approximately 135. You can kind of see in our viewport that at the exact same place as the cube polygons. So let's bring it out in Z a little bit by 0.1. So it's always on the outside. And we can also luckily scale along our edges to get it to fit. Uh, let's just go like that for now. We'll zoom in a little bit. Let's apply this EMC material to our mesh. We've only made the patches that are going to hold the decals. Let's grab the textures we exported from Photoshop and bring them into Redshift. You can see if we hook them up to the output that along the edges, it looks pretty good. It lines up to where we want it to, but we only want it to be on the edges. We don't want it to affect the rest of the object. To solve that, we're going to use a Redshift object tag and user data inside of the material. First, we're going to set object ID to one. And then in Redshift, we're going to go down to user data, integer user data, and we're going to use the attribute of object ID. Now this gives us the object ID that we're looking for, but we can't use it unless we also use a switch. To illustrate what it does, I'm gonna add a bunch of colors in here. Let's pipe this in. Now you can see that whatever object ID we assign, we can decide what color that is in the shader switch. Now we don't wanna see the decal on the faces of our object. We only wanna see it on the trim. So we're setting up our selectors like this. These ones don't really matter, but just to be safe, I'll set them to zero. And to have that alpha only show up in that area, we're gonna use a vector multiply. This multiply is the core of the effect. Anything you do needs to run through this multiply for it to make sense. But now that we have this map, we can take our normal atlas, pop it into a bump node, set to tangent space, that's a gotcha there, and use a bump blender node to take our normals and add them with the normals of the material using the alpha as a mat. And here's what that looks like. All of this extra geometry is still visible in the render, and we need to get around that. But all we have is just the mat for our trim. We can combine that with the object ID mat to get exactly what we want. So let's invert this shader switch and then add them back together. Now we have a proper alpha mat to drive our overall opacity color. Now we're not getting any of this extra geometry visible in the render. It's only showing up where our normals are. But you can kind of tell that it doesn't look like a normal decal, it just looks like a texture that's been painted on. And that's where this trick comes in. We're assuming that all of the lighting calculations will be handled by the bump. 
And so therefore we don't need our fong tag anymore. So if we turn it off, if I look around here, it's starting to look like it should. It looks like the edge is being eaten away by our mat. And it's pretty convincing too. If I rotate the dome light a little bit, the lighting acts as it should because it's being handled by the bump and not by the geometry anymore. Let me tidy up a little bit. By turning off the fong angle limit, you can get these decals to look like real edge decay and edge wear, but without any of the extra geo you would need to actually implement this. There are just a handful of things we need to check to make sure you, there are no seams. If your cloner transform offset is too high, uh, you'll be able to see the shadow from your decal and it ruins the effect. We've already got a redshift object tag on our geometry and we can just turn the visibility of shadows off and also turn AO off so there's no contact shadows. Even with it being so far offset, it's still a pretty convincing effect. Finally, you might be wondering why I haven't been addressing the corners. And that's because it can be a little bit difficult to have all three of these things come and intersect the corner at the same time. In this case, this kind of top left decal is being obscured by the other two. But there is a quick fix for that. If you make a random effector, zero out the position, but do set it to the same offset value that you've got, you can offset the values just enough that the polygons aren't all in the same world space position. Now you can just go to the material tag, and if you want a different edge, you can put in the offset. This technique works best if you spend the time to manually place all of these trim edges, but the effect when it is cloned is still pretty good. I mentioned earlier how I couldn't find any normal edge decal mats online, um, and so I'm going to put a whole bunch of these on my site. Uh, you can find that at the link on screen. I don't know what it's going to be yet. I hope editor me in the future puts that in there. Like I said last time, if you make anything with this technique, I want to see it. Hit me up. I'm at JC Tecklenburg on Twitter and Instagram. That's the tutorial. Bye.